Okay, we're good to go. Uh, so uh, welcome, thank you everyone. We're so excited uh, to share some of our journey with you guys. Um, thanks to Media Post for having us. Um, hopefully, you know, by the end of the next 20 minutes, you'll come on a little journey with us of uh, where we've been in the last couple years and, and where we think uh, we are going in the future. Um, okay, so the tour guides for this journey, uh, my buddy here, Abe, who's the head of global and consumer insights, uh, sorry, global uh, consumer data across all of PepsiCo. Uh, and I'm Kevin Moeller. I lead uh, media insights and analytics for the North America sectors. So um, just a show of hands, anybody know, anyone recognize this brand? <laughs> anyone? Okay. So we, we are Pepsi. Um, I, actually, I should say, I've been with PepsiCo for uh, about nine months. So in PepsiCo world, that's very, very early days. Um, and I came and I wanted to work at Pepsi. And what I quickly realized is, especially on our beverages side, it's not just Pepsi. We have tons of iconic brands that are in the homes of millions of Americans every single day. Um, whether it's CSDs, whether it's our, our tea partnerships or our coffee partnerships, um, as well as getting into the water space as well. Um, but we also have our friends at Frito-Lay uh, with, again, a ton of really iconic brands that are in most households in America. Then we also have some other really, really uh, iconic brands out of our Chicago office in Quaker and Tropicana and Gatorade. But as the uh, consumption patterns of Americans have changed, we've evolved our product offering for that change. So a lot of our products are fun for you. They're a, a snack or a drink that make you feel good. Um, we also have a ton of brands that are new and up and coming in the space that are really good for you. And they represent a changing uh, demand from consumers in America, like Bubbly and G Zero, uh, as well as Stacy's and Sun Chips and Smart Food. Um, we've also evolved our, from a strategic angle. Um, you may have read a couple months ago, we closed an acquisition of a little company out of Israel called SodaStream. Um, again, this represents the changing strategy of, or the evolving strategy of PepsiCo into uh, not just um, our historic legacy of snacks and, and bottled drinks, but really getting beyond the bottle. Um, SodaStream also represents a strategic initiative that is very important to uh, everyone at PepsiCo in, in our sustainability and ensuring that, that the world is uh, focused on things like recycling and uh, more environmentally safe um, areas. So we aren't just Pepsi, we are PepsiCo. Uh, we have roughly 22 or 23 brands uh, that are over a billion dollars in revenue. Um, so we're not, we're not tiny um, and it's uh, still an important uh, place for us to ensure that not just that we have had a great history and a great run, but that we future-proof ourselves, like all of you out there, um, for how the changing dynamics, especially in, in media and analytics, um, are bringing uh, to the marketplace in the next couple years. Thank you, Kevin. You're good. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I think as everybody talked, uh, Adam mentioned in the morning, Steve uh, set it up a little bit, uh, a lot of the challenges and dynamics that we're talking that are changing are, uh, are not necessarily unique to PepsiCo. They're also the similar challenges that we are facing. Uh, for years, I think a company like PepsiCo, we have been uh, great with uh, three levers of mass distribution, mass manufacturing, and mass communication. But we all know all of those dynamics are uh, getting disrupted. The distribution channels, especially with delivery and e-commerce, are evolving really fast. Uh, mass communication channels are evolving even faster speed. Uh, we now no longer have a captive audience. Gone those days when you could buy a TV ad and reach millions of people immediately and spike up your brand awareness. And in the world we live in now, you need to earn that attention. Uh, I think it's something that brands now have to earn because your consumer demands it. And as PepsiCo, we are acknowledging that. And as we are acknowledging that, we are also realizing that some of the reality of dynamics of external 
um, environments are evolving and changing more rapidly. It was mentioned already that retailers are almost becoming publishers and media networks. They are realizing the power of understanding consumer and consumer data and applying it in terms of ways how manufacturers like ours can reach. Subscription services, evolving cord, cutter, cord cutting are all the factors that are limiting the scale and the reach that marketers like us used to have. So we need to adapt and we need to shift to that. Data restrictions, data breaches. Consumer is getting more conscious and aware of their rights of data. This puts us a little bit at a point where we need to take a step back and think what the future would be. As Kevin mentioned, the future proofing, we are completely looking at the future as something that we need to not only own, but create. And why do we need to create it? We need to create it for some of the obvious reasons that I think all of us believe that needs to be done. We want to be better targeting our consumers so we are really reaching the right person who matters. We really want to be personalized so we are talking the right message that matters to that consumer versus just talking to them. And then we want to be able to look at data, look at analytics in a way that are more meaningful at those KPIs that matter. Data is in our DNA. We are taking a step where we need to put data, consumer understanding to the core of what we do. How are we doing it? How are we doing it? We are on a journey. We are on a journey where we are trying to take a step towards understanding data from our first party to second party to third party, all of these different signals that you have access to, trying to take them and integrate them to create a holistic consumer understanding. Bring that data into our data lake, maybe Lake Tahoe. In full disclosure, I did uh, suggest that we replace this image with a, an image of Lake Tahoe for the wonderful event here See, today. contextual I marketing. <laughs> On point. <laughs> that ultimately is an attempt for PepsiCo to better understand their consumer. What that means, in a practical way, it means knowing your consumer well. Because these are your consumers, and they have their motivations, their behaviors, their nutrition choices, their food and beverage choices. And if you understand them better, what they buy, where they buy, and also understand that why behind, for whom they're buying it why they are ch changing their preferences. It not only fuels your marketing and advertising, what we are starting with, but ultimately fuels to that goal of being more consumer-centric, being more in the service of that consumer that we aim to be in. I'm going to show an example of how we are approaching it. Ultimately, creating this consumer data and drawing insights from it is really great, but how do you put it to practice? For us, ultimately, it means a fundamental shift from a brand first to an audience first approach. Historically, we have always created a number of brand campaigns. I'm a brand and I need to create a campaign and I need to reach, reach as many people as possible so I can target them and I can hope that they will go and buy my product. An audience first approach is very different. It puts consumer first. It tries to take an attempt of understanding who these consumers are and why and what they like about your brand. What are their motivators? Here's an example of Quaker overnight oats. As we were launching this brand, as we were launching this innovation, we collected this data and we tried to analyze and harmonize and used real data scientists' resources and capabilities to understand different motivators and behaviors. Oats is not new, but overnight oats was a new behavior. People were getting onto this new trend of creating oats overnight and using it as for their breakfast. What we realized was there were different segments of audiences who were creating and getting onto that phenom for different reasons. There were people who were doing it for fitness reasons. There were people who were doing it for convenience because they're busy and they wanted something healthy conveniently in the morning. And there were people who were just identifying it as part of their healthy routine that they wanted it to be part of, which ultimately allowed us to look, rather than the broad demographic targeting of probably an age group and a particular gender to go after, to really leverage the power of data and create meaningful consumer segments. Each of these segments were rooted and backed by core insights, which ultimately were something that we integrated in our brief, in our story, in our message that we wanted to tell. And here's an example of how this audience-first approach is ultimately enabling into creative. Personalization is not new. Everybody wants to do personalization. 
But if you really understand that consumer, you can still be true to your messaging, stay core to that one common core message, but can still tweak to speak to that consumer more relevantly, to that one-to-one -one personalization that you could do. We are on this journey, but we have a long way to go, and Kevin will talk on our path. Apparently, we're going to solve it, too. Yeah. Um, so as Abe talked about, we, we are actively addressing uh, some of the data issues um, that come with being a CPG company in general, um, not necessarily having all of the data uh, about our consumers or about our sales that we would like uh, at our fingertips. Um, we're making huge strides in Obvious Team, uh, not just from a global perspective, but really pushing that down throughout the entire organization and really understanding more about who our target consumers are through this consumer uh, uh, data lake. Um, <clears throat> but with that understanding of our consumers comes a responsibility uh, for myself and my team and our broader organization to act on that data. Um, so it's not just about capturing the right people at the right time, but what are we going to do with it? How are we going to act and improve our ROI? How are we going to improve our investments in the marketplace as a result of having more and better data? Um, so we've taken a three-step approach uh, at PepsiCo, um, and we are on a years-long journey. Um, we're not solving this tomorrow, um, but if we don't attempt to solve it, we'll be left behind. And we know that, and so we are staying ahead of where the marketplace is to ensure that we are uh, future-proofing future -proofing ourselves for success. Um, so we're building a, a tremendous amount of capabilities in-house. Um, and this is uh, really about a strategic shift to ensure that all of the data that Abe and his team um, capture and manipulate and manage and cleanse gets used in everything that we do. Um, he talked about data is in our DNA, and we have to ensure that not just from a strategic angle, but from an execution and actional, actionable angle, and a measurement angle, that data is intrinsic to who we are as marketers, and to hold ourselves accountable to uh, the performance in, in market. Um, it also allows us to, to control our own destiny. Um, we have really, really, really strong partnerships with our media agencies and our creative agencies, and that's not changing. Um, but what is changing is inside PepsiCo for us to act on and utilize the data through a, uh, these new tools and capabilities that we're building to supplement some of the things that our partners historically uh, have, that we have historically relied on our, our partners to do. Um, it brings us to the table a little bit closer to um, that special relationship that a marketer and their agency have. Um, we've also uh, streamlined our process. So our uh, structure, the fact that Abe and I are here together on stage, one representing global, one representing North America, I think is testament to how, as an organization, we have shifted uh, some of the structure so that whether it's, it's, it's bred and born in North America and gets leveraged up through Abe and pushed out to the rest of the uh, uh, markets or developed in some market that Abe works with closely, he brings it up and then we embrace it from a North, North America standpoint. Those shifts in operational strategy allow us to really leverage the size and the scale that we bring to the marketplace with our $22 billion brands. Um, and then also to ensure that, uh, as, we, as we all know in this room, the marketplace is changing in terms of talent. Um, it's really, really hard to retain top talent. Um, it's really hard to get top talent in the first place. Um, and so ensuring that not only are we um, working with our current staff, but bringing people in from the outside. Um, I've been at PepsiCo for nine months. 10 months maybe, um, and uh, my background, I've never worked on the client side before. Um, so I'm, I'm coming mostly from the media agency side. So bringing a different and unique perspective, and when we go out to hire into the marketplace to ensure uh, that we are grabbing the right talent or taking the, the talent that we have in-house and cross-training them across a number of different disciplines, um, that gets us that much stronger as an organization so that we hear from different perspectives um, different uh, expertise, different points of view, so that together, when you get into a room, diversity of thought is extremely important to drive the entire uh, ship forward. 
Um, and so, so what are we going to do to ensure uh, that we're leveraging all of the data that Avi and his team are working on? Um, I had an old boss who, who said this to me once, and it took a little bit to resonate with me. Um, but we can now do the things that we always wanted to do. So take a minute and just think about that. If you, it may sound corny, it probably will, but if you can dream it and you can think about it through technology, through data, we can now do those things. And there's intrinsically a ton of problems when it comes to data, especially sales data in our industry. But we can't let that stop us from making progress. So I would challenge everybody in this room, if you have something, a project or um, a capability that you always wanted to build, um, that you wanted to bring to your boss or push down to your team, um, try it. Don't, don't, let some, uh, don't let the limitations of either the data or the infrastructure or your uh, strategic uh, uh, development of your company, don't let that hold you back. Um, push yourselves, push your teams, um, because it's, it's really an exciting time to be in media and analytics. Um, I'm lucky enough to be in the space for uh, over 15 years. And I can honestly say, like, where we were when I first started and did my first internship at Nielsen to where we are today, it's, it's light years. It's, I mean, it's massively different. And what the next 15 years are going to be, we probably can't even imagine. So uh, I would challenge everyone in the room to just uh, put on your positivity hat with all the limitations that I already spoke about and ensure that if, if there's something that you want to do out in the marketplace, uh, I'm sure through technology and data you can get 80% there, and that's 80% more than you were yesterday. So uh, it's just always pushing it forward. Um, so th thinking about the limitations uh, of our category specific to CPG, how can we leverage and embrace those challenges to our strategic advantage? Um, and for us at PepsiCo, it's really a, a managed approach. Um, it is a journey. It is not all complete today. Um, but we are really far along from where we were six months ago and from where we were six months before that. And I expect six months from today, we'll be talking about different capability and tools. Um, so the first thing is there's a lot of uh, behavioral data out there, right? Especially digital. The great thing about digital is um, it produces data. Um, just the, the process and, and management of how uh, media buys are executed and measured, um, we have a lot of signals in the marketplace for how a campaign is performing. Um, so I would encourage you to act on those signals. Um, whether they're deterministic to sales, we'll get to that in a second. But if we know that our, we have CPM benchmarks and we're monitoring a campaign and the CPM benchmarks are higher than, uh, or the, our CPM in the marketplace is higher than our benchmarks, it's our obligation to act off of that data. We know we're not going to have a, a positive ROI if the CPM, is, if the costs are higher than what we anticipated them to be. That's simple math. That's not complex analytics. That's kind of common sense when it comes to how to evaluate uh, media campaigns. Same thing with um, uh, placements and uh, media partners that you work with. Really hold them accountable and act on the data that is in front of you. Um, taking that a step further is we have a number of initiatives underway that um, will be released later in the year that uh, look to uh, understand the relationship to other metrics that can be captured in real time um, that we can use to identify are they leading indicators to sales. Everyone in this room, all of the CMOs out there, that's what they care about. They want to, they, everyone wants to build a brand. Everyone wants to um, drive the company forward. Um, and they do so by ensuring that they've hit their sales numbers. Um, if we can't get sales correlated to a campaign in real time, what can we do in real time? What can we capture in real time that we know is a leading indicator to performance from a sales perspective? Um, and that could be. Uh, identifying those behavioral metrics. It could be those brand health measures. Um, so through whether it's um, uh, ad wallet or other uh, 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 ad effectiveness studies in the marketplace, you can capture real-time exposure and um, brand health metrics as a result of that exposure. 
if we make that link then to sales and that relationship, we can then act on those longer term brand building metrics with a knowledge of what they deliver in the short term for sales. Um, the other thing is uh, taking some historical analytic tools like marketing mix model and kind of flipping them on their head. Uh, mix modeling is great. Uh, it's wonderful, actually, as a report card. It tells us all of the drivers of growth, how our campaigns performed, how our brands performed, given the spend and the, and, and the uh, campaign in the marketplace. Um, mix modeling has its drawbacks. It's three months uh, delayed. Um, you, it may not be able to get as granular as you would like to make optimizations against. Um, so how can we take something that is historically, that, that is traditionally looking backwards and flip it on its head and use it to predict what is going to happen in the marketplace? And that's something that we've started to do to great success uh, within the media and analytics team. Um, the other thing is other types of advanced analytics. So looking at a paid, owned, earned, shared model. What is that relationship to... Um, what is that relationship of paid media to owned and shared and earned media? Um, it's incumbent upon all of us with any media budget, let's maximize everything else before we actually start putting money into the marketplace. So how do you leverage your paid, or your owned, your shared, your earned? What is that relationship to driving sales? And how can paid amp help amplify some of those uh, channels? Um, we've also developed a technology using AI, um, and I know AI is the buzzword for the last 18 months, but this is AI, um, of um, actually uh, analyzing creative uh, to the most granular degree to predict how that creative is going to perform while it's in market, and then linking that back to some more standard uh, analytic tools like marketing mix model, which then fuel the future uh, uh, understanding of how our campaigns are performing. Um, so again, these are just a handful of things that we are doing within our walls and within uh, with our partners, our media agency, our creative agency, and our uh, third-party data partners um, to help really um, embrace the fact that we work in a very challenging category uh, where, sale, <coughs> excuse me, where sales are not uh, readily accessible in a real-time basis, and uh, we have to be a little bit more creative in how we analyze campaigns and uh, take action as a result of them. Um, and then the last piece of this is Abe can solve our data problems. Thank you. My, right. team, my team can work to solve the analytic uh, and measurement issues, but if we just partner together and exist in our little uh, duo here, um, and we don't democratize the results, democratize analytics and data within the entire organization, then we failed. Because our goal is to put ourselves, and I'm going to say this lightly, is to put ourselves out of business um, so that our jobs become obsolete because we have taken the really advanced analytics um, that have existed in silos or existed within the analytics group or within the research or insights group or the data and MarTech group. Um, and our goal is really to democratize that so that marketers who traditionally have been really focused on creative and building brands, that we give them the tools so that uh, the fear behind data gets reduced, so that um, analytics that has been held historically within one group is now in the fingertips and the hands of all of our marketers. They're going to be able to make better decisions. They're going to be able to hold themselves accountable. Um, and they're going to be able to work better with our creative partners, our media partners, and our, uh, our other brand partners that we want to uh, work with um, if we have democratized all not just the results, but actually the capabilities and the tools that our teams are developing. Um, and we're doing so through uh, collaboration. Um, so rather than working through meetings and setting up emails and, you know, think about how much time is wasted throughout your day in either just setting up a meeting and trying to get on someone's calendar or, hey, let's get everybody in the room and it takes three weeks to happen and by that time, that real time is no longer real time, it's post-campaign. 
how do we fix that? Uh, so we're working with a very, very, very large um, compu computing software company um, that is uh, working with us to develop uh, uh, a holistic user interface that all of the tools and capabilities that I kind of talked about sit within and are democratized to all of our marketers. Um, not from a back office analytics uh, uh, data cruncher, but put in a way that's visually appealing, easy to understand, and um, has the capability to really, really change how they work from a workflow perspective, an accountability perspective, and really collaborate within uh, their different groups. So in the end, um, as, as we walk through this journey, uh, there are two takeaways that I'll say um, we would love to leave, uh, leave you guys with. Uh, first, it's this mindset and mentality. So Kevin already talked about the uh, strong collaboration that the different teams are having, and, and we're trying to grow it with the mentality of thinking what's next, what's the future. But it's, it's the mentality of being a startup. It's the mentality of being in in this mindset of that we need to create something for tomorrow. We need to be open and be comfortable with the failure. We need to be comfortable to go into the uh, uncharted territories and do things that typically CPG companies are not known for is basically what our journey is. As the slide says, uh, it's a long journey. It's a multi-year journey that we ourselves are acknowledging. We'll optimize that journey. We'll get there faster. Exactly. We're trying to get there faster. Uh, and the second thing that I'll say, what uh, Kevin touched upon, um, we fundamentally believe what capabilities, the technology, the data, and our evolution is not just limited to what the, the teams do, but also the processes and bringing everybody along from an organization point of view is the fundamental shift that will help us get there. We, we don't kid when we say our hope is that that becomes the future of marketing. I personally really don't like the word digital marketing because I think the word digital marketing should not exist in five, 10 years from now. That should just be marketing. And that's just the way how we should be doing. Because if you really understand, and this ambition we have, the C in the CPG stands for consumer. And if we don't really put that to the center and really build these processes and capabilities, we will not get there where we want to. We want to move from this mass reach approach to a truly predictive, hyper-personalized approach where we are really making those personalized one-to-one -one relevant connections with our consumer based on knowing who they are and using it in the entire ecosystem through an agile, technology-driven optimization process that helps us act faster and course correct that we historically are probably not very used to. With all of that, thank you so much for having us here. Kevin. Kevin, Abi, thank you very much. We have time for some questions. And again, uh, tell us who you are and who you're with so we get to know you. Uh, Steve Winnihan with Jebit, and this question's for Abi. Abi, you, you had a slide up about knowing your consumer well, and you had different kind of buckets of kind of understanding, and you had things like values and beliefs and motivation. How do you, how do you today get that type of data from the consumers? So it's a little bit of an ambition and it's a little bit of a work in progress. Uh, as I was talking about, uh, we do have access to some data. There is data targeting using data is not new to us. And it's our attempt to integrate it all, war, uh, all together and use algorithms and data to better understand what we know. And especially with as the, uh, the landscape is changing, a lot of our D2C brands are evolving. It is helping us better understand consumer preferences. So it's a little bit of a journey. I don't necessarily have uh, the exact way to define right now. We are ourselves building it. Over, over here. Hi, I'm Dean Jackson, Life Extension, nutritional supplement company, South Florida. Question for either of you, uh, actually two part, I'll kind of cheat and throw in an extra question, but um, you mentioned the iterative process and AI to affect creative. I was just wondering how, can you just comment a little bit more about how that's executed? Is that through digital asset management, or is it is the machine learning kicking it back and you're creating manual creative, or is it really, truly automated? And I guess the second part of the question is from, uh, how do you tie the brand awareness metrics to 
conversion or sales? Sure, so I will answer your second question. Um, that's what we're working on. Um, so I think through a series of mixed models, secondary models, understanding not just correlation but causation, um, that's what we're attempting to do is to really, and I think, to be honest, it's, it's no one in the industry has been able to do this or had proven results that, that showed uh, what brand metrics, whether, whether it's awareness, it may not be awareness, um, probably where is awareness, um, uh, how they correlate to sales and how you blend that understanding of what's happening in the short term and that's actually producing sales and how you're building the brand in the long term and uh, what that relationship is. So uh, it's an analytical uh, challenge that we're really tackling. Um, I do know that there's other uh, industry organizations out there. Um, I'll give a plug to Joel Rubenstein, um, who uh, many of you may know who uh, is part of Wonks, um, is uh, also working with the MMA for a similar type of project. So if there's any CPG marketers out there who want to get in on a broader industry-wide uh, study, I would reach out to the MMA on something like that. Kevin, Abby, thank you very much. That was a great start. And we're going to continue this in the roundtables at the end of the morning. Thanks so much.